All right, so now with no further ado, let me introduce our next speaker who is uh, waiting in the bullpen there. Uh, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, as I mentioned earlier, he is known uh, affectionately as the dynamic deacon and he speaks primarily on areas of marriage and family like discerning the will of God the sacraments male spirituality like he's going to talk about today pro-life issues evangelization prayer and a whole lot of other topics as well uh, he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics and business administration from the University of Notre Dame and more importantly, <laughs> I didn't know Notre Dame got whoops, but uh, <laughs> somebody thought I said a and M. I I think that's what happened. Uh, he also, interestingly, has a degree in Master of Theological Studies from the University of Dallas. Praise God. He is uh, the author of a best-selling book called Behold the Man, A Catholic Vision of Male Spirituality, which was published by Ignatius Press. He is married to his wife, Colleen, and they have four children, and they live in Portland, Oregon, and he also has duties at Immaculate Heart Catholic Church. I did a little research online last night, and I found one testimony, uh, which I think really kind of summarizes the impact that people have had in listening to, and I don't mean to build it up too much and put too much pressure on you, but uh, this, is, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is one of the testimonies. Somebody said, just wanted to say, I heard you preach on EWTN today, and I was yelling, amen, out loud. You're an amazing witness to God's amazing love for his people. Thank you for your yes to God. He is using you to touch millions. Thank you for not being afraid to feed his sheep. Keep going, Deacon, keep going. Uh, it's so refreshing to hear a brave speaker of the word of God and to, who serves us meat and potatoes and not just fluff. Uh, you fed me today, thank you. So that was one testimony of somebody who heard uh, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers and obviously was a little bit touched by what he had to say. So Deacon Harold Burke Sivers' uh, talk today is called Vocation and Mission in the Lives of Catholic Men. So please stand up once again and give a big North Texas welcome to Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. We are called to be salt of the earth and light of the world. Salt does three primary things. It seasons, it purifies, and it preserves. First of all, salt seasons. It makes things taste better. In order for us to be truly the men that God created and calls us to be, we have to season our minds and our hearts with God's word and the sacraments. As Father Longenector talked about, we have to engage our minds. We have to open up the Bible and see ourselves and our lives and our stories in the page of the Word of God. We have to be nurtured and fed by the graces from the sacraments in order truly to be seasoned by the salt of God. Salt also purifies, which means we have to, and which I'm going to talk mostly about today, the sacrament of reconciliation bring us back when we have fallen away, when we have walked away, when we have chosen ourselves over God. God gives us the sacraments, reconciliation, and the grace to draw us back to him so it purifies. And so also preserves. If we cooperate with the grace that God has given us in the sacraments of the church, we will preserve that everlasting life that God died for, for each one of us. And when we do all those three things, then we can be light. Because we cannot keep the faith to ourselves. Where we're really good at being Catholic is in here. Where we suck is out there. I'll give you an example. I was preaching at a parish in California that doesn't have deacons. And I was preaching, uh, like when I did the mission here, I did preach at all the masses, and then I give talk Sunday night through Wednesday night. So it was the first mass, Saturday vigil mass. I'm back in the sacristy. I'm dressed. I'm ready to go. All these people get extraordinary ministers. And all these people come in and signing their names on the thing that they're there. And the sacristy's pretty full. Father comes in five minutes before mass because he just finished hearing confessions. And he looks around the room and goes, oh, yeah, uh, Jim, we won't need you. 
uh, to uh, uh, carry the book of the Gospels because the deacon is here. He'll do that. He's going to uh, read the gospel and preach. And oh yeah, Mary, we won't need you to be an extraordinary minister of uh, communion because the deacon is an ordinary minister like me. He's going to be distributing communion with me. <clears throat> and so they looked at Father and said, but we're on the list. <laughs> and Father, to his credit, said, oh, you know what? That's my fault. Uh, we typically don't have a deacon here, and I meant <clears throat> for the person who was filling out the, the list to, to put in the deacon's name, I forgot it slipped my mind. That's my fault. But he is here, and he's, he needs to be, uh, he's going to exercise the ministry he's ordained to do. And they said, well, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> and I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> the church has got this part figured out where we got to go. Look. Right now, people are confused about what marriage is, all right? Here's basically what the Supreme Court said. What is this? No, it's Pepsi. <laughs> you know why it's Pepsi? Because I'm the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And I, what you thought since the beginning of time was marriage, I am now telling you that this is now Pepsi. What is this? Pepsi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you would have spoke up like that before, maybe we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. Instead of men sitting on their bus watching television, we need to go out there and live our faith with passion and conviction. We need to be salt and light to the world. How do we do that? First thing we have to do, we have to be men of prayer. We have to be men of prayer. But here's what, I, here, you know, instead of being men of prayer, here's what kind of men we are. I was doing a parish mission last summer. And I was greeting people after Mass, and this woman comes with her beautiful children. Hey, everybody, hi, guys, hey. And I said, where's your husband? Because <laughs> I thought he was there. So she goes, oh, uh, well, Deacon, my husband, uh, he's not here. I said, oh, well, given the benefit of the doubt, well, maybe he's a physician. He's doing rounds at the hospital. Or maybe he's a fireman. He days on at the station. Uh, well, no, Deacon. You see, my husband, he's a good person. <laughs> and if you met him, oh, you really like him. He's kind and he's generous. He'd give you the shirt off his back. But he just doesn't see the point in going to Mass every Sunday because he says he can worship God any way that he wants. Oh! <laughs> I see. Well... When you get home, tell your husband something from Deacon Harold. <laughs> tell him I said, there are no good people in heaven. There's not one good person in heaven. The only people in heaven are who? Saints. And Jesus says we are all called to be saints. He uses the word tilios in Greek or talmim in Hebrew. When he says perfect as the heavenly father is perfect, what it means is mature whole and complete in our faith. It doesn't mean without error because nobody can do that. It means mature, whole, and complete. Salt and light to the world. So, and I dare you to show me any place in this Bible where Jesus says, just be good and you'll get in. Show me where it says that. Just be a good person and you'll get to heaven. It doesn't say that. Jesus says the road to heaven is narrow and very few people will find it. But we all think the road is wide. Jesus says the road to hell is wide. <laughs> That's where most of the people are. And I guarantee you, if some of you left this church right now, went outside, got hit by a bus, and died, you're going to hell. Straight up. You're going to hell. I'm going to talk about that in a second, too. Here's what we, look, here's what we have to do. Let me take the excuses away about this good person garbage. This is why most of our kids are leaving the church. See, here's what happens. There has to be a transition between this is my parents' faith and this is my faith. I own it now. Huh? I take what my parents have given me and now my faith is my own. What's happening is this is not being made and a lot of kids are falling through the gaps here. Why? Because men aren't stepping up and witnessing to the faith. I saw in a, in a very introduction to my book, it has a study that shows 
Young adults that continue to practice their faith and those who stop practicing their faith. What's the number one factor for young people continuing to practice their faith after they leave their parents' house? Their fathers went to church with them. It's even double than when mom just takes them by herself. So when the kids are little, all about mommy. But when it comes to that transition of actually taking this faith and living out in the world, and how do I navigate through this more relativism, all this garbage in the culture? That's where dad comes in. Dad's, not just his words, his witness, his example, and how he's a man of faith. That's how we save our young people in the church today. So instead of the excuses, I'm a good person. And what do we do? When we say we're good people, that means that we don't have to pray. We don't have to pray, so we're not men of prayer. In fact, we make excuses. Why we don't pray with our wives and with our children, or even priests, why they don't pray? And why, is I, why do I say priests don't pray? So what are you talking about, deacon? They pray all the time. Hold on a second. I meet with bishops on a regular basis, because I usually do conferences. They usually do the mass at the end or have dinner with them the night before, something like that. And I say, Father, uh, did, uh, Your Excellency, when you have a priest that comes to you who wants to leave the priesthood, and you have that first meeting with him, what do you say to him? He said, most bishops tell me the first thing they ask is, when did you stop praying? First thing they ask. So what do we have to do with men pray? Here's the three excuses I hear of why men don't pray with their wives or with their children. Here's three excuses. Excuse number one, I don't have time. Well, Deacon, you don't understand how busy I am. I have a job that's very responsible. I have, I have to commute back and forth to work. I have all these responsibilities. I got this in the parish. I've got this going on over here. I, I just don't have time. I just, let, me, let me translate that for you. <laughs> I don't have time really means it's not important to me. Because whatever else you're doing, instead of praying with your wife and kids, that's what's important to you. Stop kidding yourself. Excuse number two, she's the spiritual one. <laughs> Deacon, I've heard you say on EW10 and on your YouTube videos that women are the very heart of God's love because they have an intimacy with the Holy Spirit that as life givers and life bearers that we men will never have. That is true. They are the spirit. But where's a priest in our house? Where's a priest? And what's the main job of a priest? To offer sacrifice, to give your life and die to yourself every day of your life to live for your wife, your family, the church, and this culture. Excuse number three. I'm uncomfortable praying with my wife. Yeah, you know, she's got her way of praying, I got my way of praying, and when we try to pray together, it's just so awkward, it doesn't feel right, it's just uncomfortable. Hey, he was uncomfortable! He was uncomfortable and he prayed from the cross. The whole point is we have to live our spirituality the way Paul tells us in Galatians. I preach Christ and Christ crucified. I, he says at the end of Galatians, I want to know nothing except the cross of Jesus Christ. And again, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Unless you can see yourself as a man living your spirituality from the cross of Jesus Christ, you're not really truly being the man that God created you to be. Let me take the excuses from you away from you right now. Let me tell you what my wife and I do. Now, Father Longenecker talked about being a Benedictine. I was a Benedictine, okay, in my 20s. I was in uh, an abbey in Newark, New Jersey. I was very happy there. Now, I'm, it, was a, it was a monastery founded from Germany, so very, you know, structured, formal prayer. You know, the Father talked about Gregorian chant. I love that stuff. I mean, I, I'm like old school, man. I love the chant, I love the incense. Choke me out on the incense, all right? <laughs> I'm from Jersey, right? Jersey, meat and potatoes, right? My wife is from Oregon, the land of the fruits and the nuts, all right? When my wife prays, oh, let the Holy Spirit just fall upon me as I walk along the Columbia River Gorge or I walk along the beach, the Holy Spirit just a fire fall. That don't work for me. So what do we do? We keep it real simple. Whenever I get up every morning, just as I did this morning, Lord, thank you for allowing me to see the light of another day so that I may give honor, praise, and glory to your most holy name. 
And then if I'm home, I grab my wife and said, Lord, I thank you for the gift of my wife. I thank you for our 22 years together. I thank you for our beautiful children. Lord, help me to be the husband and the father that I need to be for them today. She says something back to me, I get out of bed. How long did that take? How long did that take? Let's push the envelope. Two minutes. There's 168 hours in a week. And you're telling me you ain't got time to pray with your wife and kids for two minutes a day? That's why your marriage and your sex life suck. <laughs> it's that simple. We have to stop. Put, what's it? We have to put on the mind of Christ. We have to start thinking and acting like people of faith, men of faith, and not men of the culture. And what is stopping us from truly being salt and light in the world today? One thing, and one thing mainly, that's fear. We're afraid to let the Holy Spirit take over our lives. We're afraid to put God first in our life as our main priority. See, it's God, here's the priority, man. God, family, everything else. That's the priority. But what we've done, see, we think it like the world, we put our job first. And then our, to support our family, and then, oh yeah, God's somewhere in there. Huh? What happens when you mess that order? You think, my job is so important, I have so much responsibility, I'm so important to my job. Really? Try this. Die. <laughs> Do you really think that whoever you work for is going to say, oh no, John is dead. We have to sell all of our multi-million dollar asset buildings and fire all of our billions of employees and we have to liquidate all of our stocks because there's no way we can continue this multinational corporation because John is dead. Really? They will mourn you for three days, then hire somebody to take your place. Where somebody can't take your place is in your home with your family. Because that's time you never get back. And what's stopping us from really putting God first is fear. And so we have to think like warriors. And one of the greatest warriors to me is David. Now, here's the deal. If you uh, have your Bibles, 1 uh, Samuel chapter 16... Uh, we see that the, David is called by God to be the new king of Israel. God is disappointed with Saul, who is the current king of Israel. So he sends uh, Samuel to the house of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, Jesse in Bethlehem, to anoint the new king of Israel. And he anoints David. So here's the, here's the deal. Jesse lines up seven of his sons, Eliab, Abinadab, Shema, and, and four others. But not David. See, David's outside with the sheep because he's only, he's only a teenager. And so Samuel sees these seven strapling, handsome, probably, you know, buff guys standing. He goes, this guy looks like a king. He goes to pour the oil of anointing. The Lord says, no, nope, not him. And Samuel's confused. He goes, I'm, I'm in the right house. This is a, the sons are here. I got the oil. What's the problem? Here's the problem. Here's what the Lord says. <coughs> the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. See, the heart for the Israelites was, just was an organ that pumped blood through your body. The heart was the seat of the will. The heart was the place where your desire for God lives inside of you. That's where God can change your life as a man. That's what God wants to do for you today. Right now, not tomorrow, not next week, right now. He wants to change your heart. He wants to speak directly to you as a man of God to your heart. So you could be, and what happened? None of the sons were chosen. They said, you got any more sons? Well, yeah, there's David out there with the sheep. The one that everybody thought was the least likely to be the king. He comes in, the Lord says, that's him anoint him. And when the oil of anointing hit David, it says, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. The spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. Let me tell you something about David. Was David perfect? No. Remember David and Bathsheba? Woo! Made for TV movie right there. <laughs> you know? 
talk about hit it and quit it. Dang, man. That dude, I mean, he what? He was an adulterer and a murderer. But Acts chapter 16 says that he's still a man after God's own heart. So you don't have to be perfect to be a man of God. You just have to be willing to do whatever it takes to cut whoever you need to cut out of your life, to let nothing stop you from being the man that God created you to be. What's stopping you is fear, because that's what stopped the armies of Israel. David shows up at the, because the, the, the Israelites are about to throw down with the Philistines. And the only reason David, David wasn't even there, he's there because his father Jesse, his brothers went to fight. He said, uh, bring some food in, to your brothers so I could, because he wanted some intel on what was going on with the battle. Well, David gets there. There's no battle. Why? Because Goliath had stepped out from the Philistines and said, okay, look, instead of all this bloodshed, you have somebody fight me. All right? I'm going to represent the Philistines. You send somebody from Israel to fight me. And he began to mock the armies of God. And, they and it says, what it says here? Saul, when, when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were stuck. They were afraid of Goliath. Now, why were they afraid of him? Let's take a look at the dude. There came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath the Goth, whose height was six cubits and a span. So a cubit is 18 inches. A span is half a cubit or nine inches. So do the math. The dude is nine feet, nine inches tall. Big dude. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. So a mail is, um, you know those King Arthur movies? They take off the outer armor, they have that kind of uh, silver, meshy kind of armor underneath. That's called mail. He said he had a coat of mail that weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. A shekel is 0.25 ounces, a quarter of an ounce. Do the math. 78 pounds of armor. So a nine feet, nine inch dude with 78 pounds of armor comes walking out and starts threatening you? They all, woo, no, not me, I ain't fighting them. No, no, not me, not me. Uh -uh. Mm. But he was mocking them, see? Now, <clears throat> David shows up to bring the food to, and he hears Goliath. And he says, are we gonna just sit here while this uncircumcised Philistine mocks the armies of Israel? Ain't no one's going to do nothing? You know, I'll do it. I'll, I'll fight him. So he goes to Saul. He goes, Saul, I want to fight Goliath. Saul's like, <laughs> dude, you're just a kid. That guy's been a warrior since he was a kid. He's going to crush you. David said, look, yeah, I'm just a kid. I'm just a shepherd. Let me, let me tell you something right now. When that lion and that bear came and snatched that sheep, I left the others behind. I went after that one sheep. I snatched it out of his mouth. And if that lion or that bear turned on me, I smoked that lion and that bear. I will do the same thing to this Philistine. So I was like, all right, your funeral. <laughs> and David makes his, only makes his only mistake here. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put on a helmet of bronze, clothed him with a coat of mail, put a sword over his armor. Hmm, who does David sound like to you? Goliath. Goliath. He's trying to look like Goliath. But what's David's response here? David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I'm not used to them. So David put them off. Because David understood you cannot fight Goliath with the weapons of man. So what I want you to ask yourselves, men of God, right now is what? is the Goliath in your life right now what is the Goliath that has you so scared that you can't take your faith to the next level that you're stuck in a lifeless marriage oh yeah you show up to Sunday every mass holding your wife's hand with your kids sitting there you can put on a good show for everybody but you know when you get home your marriage sucks why is your prayer life just stuck why is your job you just stuck you can't take anything to that next level because there's something holding you back. What is it? The girl you raped when you were in college? When she was drunk? The abortion that you took your girlfriend to have? Maybe it's the porn or masturbating while you're watching the porn. You think you're a real man. You're a whore of Satan. Maybe it's the alcohol. 
the drugs. They're trying to escape from reality. And you're just digging a hole peep, uh, deeper on the pit to hell. What is it right now that's got you so scared that you are just stuck exactly where you are? Maybe you leave the men's conference, you're on a high. Then after life starts to creep back in, you fall right back down to the sorry state where you were before. Peter warns us about this. In 1 Peter, the devil is a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. What's your Goliath? And when you try to face that Goliath, you fail. Why? Because you're trying to fight with the weapons of man. It doesn't work. What did David do? David took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag or wallet. His sling was in his hand and he drew near the Philistine. So David reaches into his shepherd's bag or wallet. He pulls out his little shepherd's bag and inside that shepherd's bag he got a sling and five smooth stones, right? A sling and five smooth stones. Now, if you understand biblical typology, I think that David fought with a type of rosary. The five stones representing the five wounds of Christ on the cross, or each of the five joyful, sorrowful, luminous, and glorious mysteries of the rosary. David understood that you could only fight the Goliath in your life with the weapons of God. Now, some of you are looking at my rosary saying, those are like bullets, Deacon. They are. The Our Father beads are 9 millimeter and 40 caliber shells pushed in together. Why? Because every time you pray a rosary, you bust a cap in Satan's ass. <laughs> the the, the uh, beads, the Hail Mary beads are made from the bones of an ox. Ox bone. Why? Psalm 92, you have given me the wild ox's strength. You anointed me with the purest oil. My eyes looked in triumph on my foes. My ears heard gladly of their fall. It's a battle cry. The cord is made from industrial strength, commercial grade fishing line, fishers of men. Each of the knots, seven knots for the seven sacraments, 10 knots for the 10 commandments, three knots throughout the rest of the rosary for the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This cross is the same cross they give to men that finish Curcio. This is a weapon. I guarantee you, men of God, you start using your spiritual weapons to fight the Goliath in your life, he will run from you. Because I tell you something right now, Satan does not want you here listening to me and Father Longenecker and other speakers today. He doesn't want you in, he doesn't want you in mass, he doesn't want you in confession, he doesn't want you in adoration. He wants you in hell with him. That's what he wants. Padre Pio called this a weapon. St. Louis de Montfort called this a weapon. This is how we defeat the Goliaths in our life. And David shows that here's what's going to happen. When you start fighting with spiritual weapons, ain't nobody got no spiritual weapons like the Catholic Church, huh? You kidding me? But here's what's going to happen. The Goliath, this, here's what Goliath did. And the Philistines said to David, am I a dog? that you come to me with sticks? And your Goliath gonna say to you, what? <laughs> Do you, don't you know who I am? I'm your porn problem. I'm your alcohol problem. I'm your drug problem. I'm your lazy spiritual problem. And you're gonna come to me with your rosaries <laughs> and your novenas and your Eucharistic adoration, and you think that that stuff is going to beat me? I'm Goliath! And what should our attitude be when that happens? When all your fears start to come back on you, when you finally are not afraid to confront and start fighting. What should our attitude? Here's David. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You, yeah, you come to me with this, but I, David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. Men of God, what do we say at every single mass? Blessed is he who? Comes to the Lord. There it is.
We say it at every Mass, but do we actually mean and understand what we're saying? We have to fight with the spiritual weapon. Now, the one spiritual weapon I want to talk to you about today, because I didn't realize, because I'm changing my talk a bit, because I didn't realize that when I, on the calendar when they plan this, that tomorrow is Divine Mercy Sunday. So I want to take full advantage of that. So one of the spiritual weapons that we have to fight with, and one of the most powerful ones, is the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Now, where does the church, by the way, get its teaching on the Sacrament of Reconciliation? Anybody know, was it like Council of Nicaea, 325? Um, maybe Constantinople, 381, Ephesus, 431, Chalcedon, 451, uh, Constantinople, 2, 553, uh, Vatican, 1, 1869. Anybody remember where you get the teaching on sin from? Mortal and venial sin? <laughs> the Bible! <laughs> Open up yours to 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 16, it says this. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, not a mortal sin, he will ask and God will give him life for whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. I do not say one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not mortal. Bam! Mortal and venial sin right here in the Word of God. The Catholic Church didn't make it up. It's right here. Sin that is mortal, sin that is not mortal. Right here. Now, why do we have to go? Now, let me go. First of all, mortal sin 101. Here's how it works. In order for a sin to be mortal, three things must be true and present at the same time. One, it must be grave matter. And usually the benchmark for grave matter is one of the Ten Commandments. Violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Now, say you go fishing and you catch a fish this big, but you tell everybody the fish was this big. Is that a sin? Of course it is. You lied. All right. Is it grave matter? No. It's a fish. Okay. <laughs> However, your wife's on her period. Damn, you can't have sex. And so you go to your little computer, you watch your little pornography, you masturbate while you're watching the porn. That's great. Mason. say, whoa, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not violating anybody. Uh, excuse me, if you look at the catechism of the Catholic Church, that is committing adultery. That is under the section of committing adultery. Why? Because Jesus says, if you even lust, Look at a woman with lust. You've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Oh, remember the heart? That's the place where your desire for God lives inside of you. You've emptied that desire for God and filled it with the desire for flesh. That's why it's there, man. If whatever grave matter act you do, if that act is done with full knowledge, and deliberate consent of the will. I know what I'm doing is wrong and I freely choose to do it anyway. If you die in a state of unrepentant mortal sin, you've lost sanctifying grace, the grace you need to get to heaven, you're going to hell when you die. In fact, the catechism says you're going straight to hell. So I'm sorry for being so soft. <laughs> <laughs> this is no joke. Like I said, some of you, if you leave this church right now before going to confession, you're going to hell because you think you're a good person, whatever that means. Now, why do you have to go to a priest? Why can't you just confess your sins to Jesus? And why, why can't you do that? I got challenged on this once. You know, I, I, I've done television work for TBN about seven or eight years ago. A lot of people see me on EWTN, not knowing that I was invited by our Protestant brothers and sisters to do some television work for them. <coughs> Uh, they invited me. I said, you know I'm Catholic, right? They said, oh yeah, we know. I said, no, you don't know. <laughs> I'm like big C Pope Catholic. I lasted about a year, then the Crouches decided I was too Catholic. I tried to tell them. <laughs> now, most of my interactions with the Protestant ministers there were very intense, but very respectful. 
So they would bring me into a room and they pull out their King James. I pull out my Bible, and Sola Scriptura and Sola Fide and uh, Purgatory and all these different things. We go back and forth. It gets intense, but very respectful. There's only twice that I felt disrespected. Okay? One, of the, one of them came to me and said, you can't show me from the word of God where your mass comes from. So I showed him from his Bible. I went line by line by line through every word of Mass. I showed him from his Bible. In fact, we didn't even get through the whole thing because he gave up. <laughs> and by the way, I have that all in the book, including all the lines from the Mass. So you can quote from, from the Bible where every line of the Mass comes from. This, but here's the second one. The second guy came up to me, goes, I was coming from shooting, going to the green room. He stopped me in the hallway. And he didn't bring me to a room. He wanted to do this in the hallway. So he's going to try to embarrass me. He said, you're that Catholic deacon. Yes, pastor. And you uh, go to a priest to have your sins forgiven? Well, yeah. And he said, you don't have to go to some man in some dark box to have your sins forgiven. All you've got to do is pray to Jesus. <laughs> and the blood of the Lamb covers you, Jesus. And it washes away your sins, Jesus. So I let him finish. <laughs> and I said to him, Pastor, how do you know for sure that your sins are forgiven? He said, what? I said, did I stutter? <laughs> I said, how do you know for sure when you're praying to Jesus that your sins are forgiven? What's the guarantee? Because it can't be that easy. Because if it was, then what incentive do I have to do anything good? If, if all I got to do is just pray to Jesus, every time I do something wrong, I could cheat on my wife, rob a bank, you know, uh, beat up an old lady on the street, I could steal from, the, 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 from Whataburger. I, no, I... I can do whatever I want. Oh, 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 Jesus prayed. Oh, 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 my sister. It can't be that easy. What's the guarantee? He just looked at me. He goes, you just pray to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit fills your heart. Jesus, you get the feeling in your heart from the Holy Spirit. I said, whoa, 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 time out, time out. You get a feeling in your heart. I said, you're basing the forgiveness of sins on how you feel? How do you know that's not acid reflux? <laughs> I said, Pastor, let me put it to you like this. Say me and you are friends. And after uh, today, we have an argument that's so intense that we're no longer speaking to each other. And I go home. My wife said, how'd it go today? Oh, I said, it went great. Except for this thing with this pastor, we're no longer speaking to each other. And then a month later, my wife says, you know, I was thinking about that thing with you and the pastor. Has the rift between you and the pastor been healed? And I say to my wife, I just know in my heart. That the rift between me and the pastor has been healed. Do I know for sure it's been healed, yes or no? No! What do I have to do? I have to have an encounter with him. I have to go back to the studio, see him again. I have to Skype him or FaceTime or email or call. There has to be some kind of interaction between us to know for sure that the rift has been healed. I said, God no longer wanted to be far away from us. He no longer wanted to speak through prophets. He no longer wanted to speak through great men of the Bible. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us because he wanted to touch us with his own hands. He wanted to love us with his own heart. I said, Pastor, show me the verse where Jesus says, the, the word that became flesh out of his own mouth, pray to me and your sins are forgiven. Show me the verse. If you say sola scriptura, show me the sola scriptura. Show it to me. So he takes his Bible, starts flipping through, he, and I, I, he starts flipping in the back. I said, I don't know what you're looking for back there. You don't see Paul on the cross for my sins. You don't see Peter or James on the cross for my sins or John. I ask you to show me where Jesus, who is God, says, pray to me and your sins are forgiven. Now, he didn't show me this verse. Here's where I think he was going. I think he was going to 1 John chapter 1, where it says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. 
All this says that an important part of the process of forgiveness is that you have to confess your sin. That's all that says. It doesn't say how the sin is forgiven. And who wrote this? John. Right? So, because John can't contradict himself, I said, well, um, you can't seem to find the verse because <laughs> it's not there. I said, let me show you where you, where you can find actually what it says. I said, uh, open your Bible. You know the one you got there with the seven books missing. <laughs> I said, but you have this one. John chapter 20. It's the evening of the resurrection. They're in, uh, they're in the upper room. Ten of the apostles are there. Why only ten? Judas hung himself. And we know the first time Thomas wasn't there. The Lord comes into the room. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed. Now, why would John include that detail? What? Simple. The only one that creates, the word bara in Hebrew means to create. The only subject of that verb, the only person that creates anything in the Bible is God. There's only twice where God creates by breathing. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, he breathed, and it's a beautiful phrasing in Hebrew. Nishmak ruach ka'im. He took his life and he poured the life of the Holy Spirit into us. The only other place is right here. He breathed us and receive the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that came into us in our creation. The same Holy Spirit that empowers all the sacraments. Receive the, whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. I said, Pastor, who was Jesus talking to? He said, the apostles. I said, amen. So what the Bible says, what Jesus says out of his own mouth, he gives specific and direct authority to forgive sins in his name to those first priests. Why did he do it that way, pastor? Why did he just say, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I said, you guys, if anybody wants to know how to forgive the sins, just tell them to pray to me and they'll be all right. Why didn't he do it that way? Why did he empower his apostles? I'm not sure. I said, okay. Not, not a trick question. What religion were all those guys? Jews. In the Jewish mind, who's the only person that can forgive sins? God. So when the Jewish people want their sins forgiven, what did they do? He said, he said they offered sacrifice. I said, okay, let's take a look at it. Leviticus chapter 5. Now, Leviticus chapter 5, the first four verses, lists a whole bunch of sins. Then verse 5, it says this. When a man is guilty of these, of the sins of verses 1 through 4, he shall confess the sin he has committed. So what is, so John says in 1 John that you have to, confession is an important part of forgiveness of sins. And the Old Testament also says that to confess the sin is an important part of the forgiveness. So the Old Testament and the New Testament agree. But there's a few more words here, right? <laughs> and... Uh, he has to confess the sin he has committed and he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord for the sin which he has committed, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. Who? The priest. Who? The priest. I thought only God can forgive sins. He does. Through the, the priest. priest. Now, I said, Pastor, if that was the only verse, you might have an argument. But let me keep going. <laughs> If they can't afford the lamb or sheep or a goat, then they would bring turtle doves or two pigeons. If they were poor, if they were destitute, they couldn't even bring that. They're supposed to bring an epath of fine flour. An epath uh, 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 is 4.99 dry gallons of grain. So they're supposed to bring a handful of it as its memorial. Oh, I wish I had time to break that open. It's memorial portion to the priest, because that's the same words Jesus used at last supper, do this in memory of me. It does not mean remember the past. It means the grace and blessing of the past are made real and present right now. And so he says, he brings it to the priest. Thus the priest shall make atonement for the sin which he has committed in any one of these things, and he shall be forgiven. Who? The priest. The pri now, pastor, there's a few more. I went through, I, I got them all listed in the book, but here... I don't have time to go through them all now, but, but uh, Leviticus chapter 4, verse 13, verse 16, where it says, the, the anointed priest, uh, verse 22, verse I, I go to uh, he, uh, Leviticus, I go to Numbers 5, I go all over the place. And at, now, after I finished all that, I said, before that's Old Testament could come out of his mouth, I said, Jesus Christ says, 
I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And because he is the Agnus Dei, we told the Picata Mundi, he is the lamb of God who takes it. We no longer have to bring a lamb or a sheep or a goat as an offering because he is the offering, the lamb of God. What do we have to bring now? Ourselves, our brokenness, our jealousy, our anger, our addiction. You know the kind of anger I'm talking about. We get so pissed at your wife, you're about to punch her in the face, you just stop yourself and goes, where did that come from? That, all of that, that's what we bring to the priest. And of course, when you go into confessional, the priest says, Jesus absolves you, right? Is that what the priest says? Jesus absolves you from your sin? Some of you are not. That means you ain't been to confession in a while. <laughs> the priest says, I, whoa, 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 whoa. how dare the priest say he can forgive sins and the only way a priest can say that is if he was given direct authority by God himself oh wait that's exactly what happened in John chapter 20 so when we go to the as a pastor we go to the priest we hear the words of Jesus using the instrument of the priest because that's exactly the way Jesus set it up so when we hear those words of the priest, the sin is forgiven, the slate is wiped clean. That's the guarantee. And I said, that's how we roll in the Catholic Church. <laughs> now, why don't a lot of guys go to confession? Very simply this, they confuse guilt with shame. See, there's difference here. Guilt means that you did something wrong, you feel bad about it, you feel guilty about it, that's good. That means your conscience is working properly. Shame is when somebody finds out what you did. <laughs> that's why, and why don't we go to confession? Because we go in there, you think, oh man, Father's gonna know who I am, he's gonna hear, he's gonna, oh, I don't want Father to notice about me, I'm worried about Father. As if the priest has anything better to do than worry about, is that Jim? Is that Mike in there? Is that, who is that in there? Look, I taught the priests all the time, including Father Flynn when I was here doing a mission, and they tell me all the time they have a, there must be a charism they receive an ordination they don't remember. They, they're not trying to figure out who you are. They're there to distribute God's incredible mercy through that sacrament. So don't go to, to the priest because you feel ashamed. If, 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 if it's that bad, go to another parish, okay? I mean, just, if you're worried about, like, if you think somebody worried about the priest hearing their voice, how do you think I feel? How do you think I feel? I was in Oklahoma City last year. I'm going through TSA, going through security. And one of the TSA agents comes up and he goes, are you on TV? I said, the kind of TV I'm on, you won't know about that. She goes, you're on that channel with the nun. I'm like, what? I'm like, how could you possibly know that? She goes, oh, my mother watches that channel all the time. And I remember I was in there helping my mom with something. She just has it on like all the time. We were doing something. All of a sudden I heard this voice. I'm like, she, and she goes, who is that? And so I just, and I saw you. And so I recognized your voice. I'm like, oh, Lord. So, so next thing I know, I'm taking a selfie with the TSA agent so she can show her mother. <laughs> you think I feel when I walk into a confessional? I'm waiting for a priest to say, okay, Deacon, grab my God, I knew it was me. <laughs> Look, don't worry about the priest thinking about who you are, all right? The priest is there to be Jesus Christ in your life. Let me, I'm going to end, just give you one great, I hope this example comes across to you how powerful the sacrament of reconciliation is, and why do you have to go to confession, especially this weekend? This is Divine Mercy Sunday. The, the, the church grants a special indulgence tomorrow, right? So in order to get the, now remember, indulgences are one of the ways that uh, the uh, temporary or temporal effects of sin are eliminated. So after the fall, right, there were two effects of sin, the eternal punishment of sin, the loss of heaven, loss of sanctifying grace, that was signified by them being kicked out of the garden. But there are also temporal effects of sin. Remember the woman, painful childbirth, your husband shall rule over you. Men now had to work with their hands and yield because the, 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 the earth will not yield to them anymore. There's, though that's the temporal, temporal punishments of sin, okay? Two effects. Those temporal punishments of sin could be um, mitigated either through indulgences on earth or purgatory after death, all right? So in order to get the indulgence, which remits either partial or all the temporal punishment of sin, first you have to go to confession. 
You have to pray for the Pope and his intentions. And you have to receive communion. You know those three things, you fulfill the requirements for the indulgence tomorrow. All your, t oh, I'm not sure if it's a plenary or a partial. You might, is it plenary or, or, or partial tomorrow? For Divine Mercy Sunday, do you know? It's plenary? So plenary, that means all of the temporal punishment of sin will be remitted tomorrow. That's, that's powerful. Why does the church have the authority to do that? Because of the keys. Because of the keys, the, the church holds the keys of the kingdom here on earth that Jesus gave authority for. All right? So here's, here's an example of how powerful the sacrament is. And if, oh, I got time. Good. Say you're working in an office. You're working in an office and you work in a cubicle, office of cubicles. And, you know, your guy that just come to church, you know, you're trying to just live out your faith. You come to the men's conference, you're, you're pumped. Up. I got to tell somebody about you. I can't keep this beautiful faith to myself. I need to share my faith. You find out at the water cooler that the guy in the cubicle next to you is a fallen away Catholic. Now, to, to keep your faith life going, you've been going to a noonday mass. Not, a, a little parish, not too far from where you work. You, in fact, you can walk there. It's just a little 10-minute walk. And so you say, I'm going to invite this guy to go to Mass with me. So you, you, know, you go to the guy in the cubicle like on Monday. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, hi, I work in the cubicle here next to you. And I, hey, I heard that you used to be Catholic. Well, I've been going to Mass down the street here at the parish uh, at noon. I'd love for you if you went with me today. I ain't going nowhere with you. Get away from me. <laughs> okay, I just thought I'd ask. But the friend is persistent. He comes back the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Finally, hello. Oh. Look, every day you come here and ask me to go to church with you, and every day I tell you no. Look, here's what I'm going to do today. I will go with you today to church on, on one condition, that after today you never ask me again. Okay, great. So... About 20 minutes, you know, before they head down, they walk, they cross the street, they walk a little further, there's the church, they walk inside, they get there 10 minutes early, and the friend, cubicle, knows that the light's on in the confessional. So he turns to his buddy, says, since you're here, <laughs> Father's hearing confessions, this would be a great opportunity for you to, he goes, I don't even want to be here with you right now. What makes you think I'm going to go in there and talk to some priest about my sins? Get out of here. I, I just thought I'd ask. But the first friend decides, I'm going to go. So he goes in, makes a good confession, comes out, does his penance, mass begins. The first friend is listening to the word of God. He understands that God is speaking to him in and through that word. He understands that he is fed twice at every mass. Because he he's like me, that gets sick and tired of hearing fall away Catholics said, we don't, I left the church because I wasn't fed. I wasn't fed. They're looking for junk food. You won't find that in the Catholic church. We are fed and nourished twice at every mass. Nourished and strengthened by God in his word, which prepares our minds, our hearts, and our souls to then receive him and be fed again, body, blood, soul, divinity, the most blessed sacrament of the altar. The other friend is, come on, come on, come on, texting, checking his email, come on, come on, come on. Finally, mass is over. He says, all right, remember our deal? Yeah, 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 okay, I won't ask you anymore. So they walk out of church, they cross the street. There's a horrific accident. Both of them are killed. They are now standing before him. Because when you die, and you will, I guarantee you at the moment of your death, you will not see Buddha, you will not see Mohammed, you will not see Confucius because they're dead! Go visit their graves! The only person you will see when you die is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is God, Jesus Christ is alive, and His name is above every other name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee must bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. So the guy from the cubicle goes first. Uh, Lord, 
of all the things I've done wrong in my life, all the sins I committed against, against your name, which one was the worst? So Jesus, without saying anything, takes a step back and reveals like a movie screen all of his unrepented mortal sins. And the last scene is from the Passion of the Christ, his bloody, broken body on the cross. Jesus turns to him and says, your sins put me there. Poof, he disappears. The first friend, it's his turn. He saw what happened to his buddy from the cube. His turn now. Uh, Lord, of all the things I've done wrong in my whole life, all the sins I commit against your holy name, uh, which, which one was the worst? Then Jesus looks at him with a confused look on his face and says, I don't remember. That's what God wants to do for you right now, men of God. He wants you to wipe the slate. You can start again. You can start again. You can start right now. Some of you heard the story about my father, huh? My father was the biggest jerk. In, my, in fact, I hated my father so much, I did not speak to him for 18 years. And when my kids began to ask about their, their grandfather, I told them he was dead. That's how much I hated that man. I don't have time. To, I have the story out there on a CD and in my book too. But, but let me tell you the end of the story which just happened because a lot of you actually don't even know this who know the story about my father. My father th through, you can hear the story on the other side, but came to faith in Jesus Christ at 74 years old through, believe it or not, EWTN. Now here's a man who, who's not baptized, not baptized, never went to church, only cursed God's name. All I heard growing up. Destroyed our family, abusive, all that, drank, all that crazy stuff. This man came to faith in Jesus Christ at 74 years old. This, and, and he almost died in, in uh, October 2012. In fact, the doctor said he won't make it till Christmas. My father survived four more years. This past October 4th, I was in a Portland airport get ready to fly to Denver, Colorado to speak at the Catholic Leadership Conference. I get a phone call from my brother. Hey man, Pop's in the hospital, he's not gonna make it. You need to come home now. I flew home, I got there 11.30, but I, had to, I, cha I literally had to change my flight in the airport. By the time I got home, it was Jersey, it was 11.30 at night. My brother picked me up, took me to Beth Israel Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. My father, we walked into the room, my other siblings were there, because I, I had to come from the farthest. The machines are doing 80% of the breathing for my father. He's in and out of consciousness. The only way his blood pressure is being maintained is with IVs. And so I got there, my siblings were exhausted, I said, I'll stay with Pop. I'll do a prayer vigil for Pop. And so I stayed till, till six in them, because I was on West Coast time. So I was three hours behind. So I stayed till six in the morning, Praying there with my father as he went in and out of con. He would, he would wake up and he'd look around like confused because he had a breathing tube. So he tried to pull the tube out and I held his hands and pop. Don't worry, I'm right here. I'm right here. He calmed back down. I keep, I do rosaries, chaplets, everything I could think of. The precious blood, novena, everything. Six o'clock in the morning, my siblings come back. I go get a couple hours sleep. We come back, meet with the doctors. There's nothing else they can do. He's not even processing the food, you know, through the IVs. He's not producing anything. He's not, it, it's the body shut down. So we decide that I call the priest just to make sure. And I, we pull all the uh, IVs and stuff. The last one was pulled at 12.55 p.m. on October 5th. My, and I started praying my first chaplet at 1 o'clock, my second chaplet of Divine Mercy at 2 o'clock. My father literally, literally took his last breath at three o'clock in the afternoon, the hour of mercy. When, and, when, and when he died, my sister started crying, my brother was yelling, pop, pop. My other brother, who's nervous about all this, came into the room, because he didn't want to be there when he died. And all I could say was, he made it till three. He made it till three. That's the hour of mercy. And you know when somebody dies, you ever been in rooms, they kick you out, so they kicked us out, and we're all hugging each other, crying. Did I remember what day it was? What's October 5th? 
Feast of St. Faustina. So, so my father, who destroyed our family, who came to faith at 74 years old, died at three, exactly 3 o'clock, the hour of mercy on the Feast of St. Faustina. The graces that he, met, he must have received for all the things that he did in his life. Now I want to end with this, man. In Ezekiel, the Lord says, If a wicked man turns away from all his sin which he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord. So turn and live. Man of God, turn, live, be salt and light so that we can change the world. Mark Twain said the two greatest days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Let today, men of God, let this conference be your why. Let God change you so we can truly be the men that God created and calls us to be. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.